Okay, so I would like to invite uh, Diane and come up, go ahead and come up now in this order. Diane, um, we're going to share with you today Jessica, Carla, Kelly, and Don. Go ahead and come on out and they're going to share with you what the Lord has given them in some wonderful ways. So, um, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence with us today. Move upon us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Enable us to open our ears to hear you, but our hearts to receive your word today, Lord. Come alive in us today, and let us plug into the power of the Holy Spirit the way that you want us to. Thank you, Lord, for the, uh, gathering us today, and, and not so much what we would say, but what you want to speak to the hearts of your people. So we ask that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My name's Diane, and this is my meditation and revelation for day one. Dear Lord, I didn't know I was a cradle Catholic until I started attending Women's Christian Fellowship. When I learned what the term cradle Catholic meant, I realized I was one too. When I read this scripture, it brought me back to one of my first days at college at UCLA. Coming from 12 years at Catholic school to this huge university, I soon learned that not everyone here was Catholic. <laughs> I lived in a co-ed dorm, and the room right next to mine was occupied by two male students, both named Joe. One had red hair, and one had blonde hair. Well, I kind of liked the red-haired Joe, but I didn't know he was Jewish until one day we were talking, and he asked me who Jesus was. And I looked at him like he was crazy that he didn't know. And I said, duh, God. And he snickered at me. And I am snickering at him thinking, oh my goodness, you made it all the way to college and you don't know who Jesus is? And my revelation is, I remember that too. And I enjoyed watching you. You were 18 years old at the time. And it was the first time that you learned that other people thought Jesus was just a prophet. You didn't even know why the red-haired Joe was snickering at you. I love that you stood firm in your faith 50 years ago. And I love that you attend WCF every Thursday because that helps you stand firm in your faith today. If you were asked the same question today, Diane, what would you say? I think it would be the same. Duh. God. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jessica, and um, I'm uh, week one, day two. Share your thoughts with Jesus in regard to his, life, uh, his light in your life. And I wrote, God is so good. I was working on this lesson when I attended daily mass on Monday, and the gospel was about not hiding our lamps under a bushel. In reading Bishop Barron's reflection for the day, it brought so much light to this question for me. Bishop Barron wrote, Light obviously isn't for itself. Rather, we see things by it. It illuminates things upon which it shines. We are light by which people around us come to see what is worth seeing. By the very quality and integrity of our lives, we shed light, illuminating what is beautiful and revealing what is ugly. So to answer question B on my thoughts as to Jesus' light in my life, I wrote, Jesus has illuminated to me all that is good and beautiful and true, and he has revealed and is still revealing that which is dark and ugly in me, which I eagerly and gratefully take to the sacrament of reconciliation as soon as his light reveals it to me. Additionally, the closer I unite myself to Christ, he also reveals through his light of truth the lies and deceptions and ugliness in the world. It makes me think of the song we sing here, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. His life makes it very, his light makes it very clear to me that I am in the world, but not of the world, thanks to Jesus Christ who lives in me. Amen. Hi, I'm Carla, and I'm reading my meditation and revelation for day two. Lord God, your word goes
goes forth with power and does not return void, but accomplishes the task for which it was sent. Jesus is that word, the light of the world that transforms my heart into the heart of Christ. Darkness tries to hide, but is um, overcome by the light. I, like John, live to testify to the light, to you, Jesus. My testimony is what you have done for me and through me. I witness to your agape love of sacrifice to forgive my sins and redeem me. My witness testifies to the power of your light, your power to change my heart and my life, to bring about peace, love, and joy from a life of anxiety and bitterness. By your light and my witness to it, others will come to believe. And for my revelation, the Lord gave me the Lord Jesus reminded me, actually, of a revelation that he had given me years ago. It was about the Holy Eucharist. The Lord said that he is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. It looks like a wafer, but he is present. He compared it to a light bulb. He said that the light bulb has a glass dome, filament, etc. But once it is turned on, it gives light to all of those who draw near. Jesus said, this is true with the Eucharist. It is a wafer. Then at consecration, it is, turns into the body, blood, soul, and divinity, and gives light to all those who draw near. Amen. Hello, I'm Kelly, and I'm reading my meditation and revelation from day two. Okay, Jesus, you are my light. When I think of light, I think think of clarity. I think of a beacon. Wait, I think I'm reading the wrong one. Oh, here it is. Sorry. I can think of light in so many ways. I think of light as being necessary for things to grow. I think of light as helping me to see. I think of light as providing warmth. Different kinds of light can promote healing. And of course, light helps us see when it's dark. All of these examples are literal ways that light, light helps me, but they all describe Jesus to me, too. And then the Lord said, we'll go back and replace light with Jesus. I can think of Jesus in so many ways. I think of Jesus as being necessary for me to grow. I think of Jesus as helping me to see. I think of Jesus as providing warmth. Jesus can promote healing. And of course, Jesus helps us see when it's dark. And then my revelation, he gave me a song. I don't write songs, by the way, but Jesus wrote this one, apparently. So I got the chorus. Last night I got two verses, so. But we'll just go with the chorus right now. Jesus, you are my light and way. Beside you I always want to stay. Whenever I'm lost, you come to find me. Your beacon of light, it helps me see. Jesus, you are my light and way. Hi, I'm Dawn, and I'm doing from uh, B. Share your thoughts with Jesus in regard to his light in your life. And the thing that, that took me was I didn't know I was in darkness. <laughs> and, uh, so when I finally, with this scripture, I, I had to write it down, and it's always been very meaningful to me, and it comes from Colossians 1, 13 through 17. For he has delivered me from the dominion of darkness and transferred me into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. And he is in the image and the light invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities or all things have been created by him and for him. And he who is, is before all things, and he is before all things and him in him, all things hold together. Amen. What a gift. Today, 
at the beginning of the Gospel of John, which we talked about last week, we talked about the Word, which is the pre-incarnate Christ Jesus. Meaning, pre-incarnate means before he became man. Now the scripture in today's lesson, we are told that Jesus, the Word, is life. And that his life is the light of men. He is the light that shines in the dark. And Jesus is a light that darkness cannot overpower. In verse 9 of our lesson, the Word, who was the true light, enlightens all people. So the, these first verses of the Gospel of John are telling us of Jesus and his presentation into the world, his incarnate as man, fully man, fully human, fully divine. And so that's what the light brought into the world. Jesus is word, light, and life. Now Jesus is the Logos. And Logos refers to the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Now, Logos gives us, through Jesus, the mind of God, the pattern, and the plan of God made incarnate. Meaning, the Word and light became flesh, and Jesus revealed the Father to us. So last week we talked about the work of creation through the pre-incarnate Christ, and now we are told by John that this Word is now made, in, made carnate, incarnate in the light. And he is the light in the world. And that's what gives us life through him. And so we have life. So what does Logos actually mean? The Logos in the Word of God made incarnate. And the Logos is Jesus, who is the divine reason and creative one identified in the Gospel of John. Now John reveals Jesus as the second person of the Holy Trinity, incarnate in Jesus, who is the Christ. Now the Jewish people were waiting for this Messiah, the Christ. Now I have to tell you this, when I was young, I thought Christ was his last name. So anyway, but I discovered that it wasn't. We all learn, don't we, Diane? So Christ is not Jesus' last name, but Christ means the Anointed One, the Messiah. Now, with God, when God promised the Messiah in the Old Testament through the prophets, He He promised that He was going to send a Messiah, and Jesus uh, is revealed. This Anointed One of God is revealed by all of the prophets and spoke of of the coming Messiah in different ways. And each book of our Bible, in the Old Testament through the New Testament, Jesus is revealed in particular ways. Each book of the Bible speaks about Jesus and reveals his nature to us. As an example, Genesis refers to the Christ as Messiah, as the seed of the woman. Exodus refers to the Christ as the Passover, the Paschal Lamb, the Lamb of God. Deuteronomy, the prophet like Moses is how Jesus, the Messiah, is described, will be. Isaiah talks about the suffering servant. Now, 2 Samuel refers to Jesus as the reigning king. The Psalms, as you know, our favorite reveals Jesus as the shepherd, the good shepherd. And in Job, Jesus is called Redeemer. And every book of the Bible, Jesus is revealed and awaited. Now I have an exhaustive list of each um, statement of, and character of Jesus in each book of the Bible, which I will share with you sometime. I'll try to get a copy so you can have a copy. I was excited to read that because it was something that I only discovered last year, that every book of the Bible talks about the awaited Messiah. So, back to the Logos. It is a Greek word, and it translates into English as word. In our religious context, it can mean the divine word, wisdom, or divine truth. So, we have also heard the word 
rhema. So there are two ways God's revealed himself. Through the logos, he became flesh and came down into the world. And, and rhema is defined as God's word that is spoken to us. Now, logos is, in truth, Jesus, who is the new covenant in person. And so he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are one. And you can't have one without the other. I was thinking about that song, but I laughed yesterday because I thought, I'm probably the only one who's old enough to know this song. And that is love and marriage, love and marriage, go together like a horse and carriage. Everybody know that one? Anyway, even, even the young. So anyway, the point is, you can't have one without the other. And uh, that is how the Holy Trinity is described. You can't have one without the other. So Jesus is the embodiment revealing the Father to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, Romans 8, 9 says, The Spirit of God has made his home in us. That is how we share in the divine mystery of Logos and Rhema. We share in the divinity of Christ through the waters of baptism, but Jesus will tell us when we study the third chapter of John that we must be born again through water and the Holy Spirit. And of course, the first thing we Catholics say is to ourselves, didn't I get the Holy Spirit when I was baptized? The answer to that is absolutely yes but the Holy Spirit has been slumbering in you until you were an adult to make that adult decision to invite Jesus in the power of his Holy Spirit into your heart and into your lives. Now, so how do we plug in to this Holy Spirit power? That's what we're answering today. And I'm so glad you asked. Now, <laughs> the Holy Spirit is in us, but we have not plugged into the power of the Holy Spirit within. And so I'm gonna share with you today how, how that happens. When is the light going to go on? When am I going to be able to spread the gospel message, the good news of Jesus? When am I going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to get well right away or be healed as I've been commanded to do? When am I going to be able to say and pray in tongues so I am praying in the perfect will of God? And when, oh Lord, will I be able to battle the enemy who attacks me in my life? Simple. The answer is, when you yield to the Holy Spirit and ask God to give you his Holy Spirit to empower you. Now John said, I baptize you with water, but there is one coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so I want to share this scripture with you um, in Luke 11, 9 through 13. It says this, So I say to you, ask, and you will be given. I say to you, seek, and you will find. I say to you, knock, and the door will be open to you. For the one who asks always receives. The one who searches always finds. The one who knocks will always have the door open to him. Now, what father among you would hand his son a stone when he asked for bread? Or who, would, who of you would uh, hand your son a snake if he asked for a fish? Or hand him a scorpion if he asked for an egg? If you then, who are evil, know how, how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So we need to ask for the Holy Spirit. And, and things will happen in our lives that are amazing. This Luke scripture is true. So I say to you, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. When you ask for the Holy Spirit, God will pour that Holy Spirit up in you. And I use this example with uh, second grade children when I taught them. And that is that... The Holy Spirit is kind of like a balloon within you. It's there, but it's not full until you ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. And then that balloon opens up the air and the ruah 
the breath of life comes into you at that time. So now, Jesus wants us to ask. He wants us to yield to the Holy Spirit the way the Blessed Mother did when she said, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let what you have said be done unto me. And that's Luke 1.38. It was then that the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and the power of the Most High covered her. We need to imitate her, yes. We also need to be obedient to what she told us to do. She said, do whatever he tells you when she asked him for prayer. She left it up to Jesus and said to the wine steward, do whatever he tells you. And so that's what we want to do. So Jesus wants us to have a share in his divinity. And when we ask him to baptize us with his Holy Spirit, he fills us up with his Holy Spirit. Father Mike Berry refers to this a baptism of the Holy Spirit as if we were having a slumbering spirit within us and sleeping. And we have to wake up the Holy Spirit within by saying, Please send your Holy Spirit into me, Lord, and I yield my life to you. And so this is how we plug into the power. We say yes and yield. So this is when we are empowered to be obedient to all God asks of us. In Psalm 78, I love this, we are commanded by God to tell everyone, and especially our children, what God has done for all of us, the world, but what has God done for each one of us personally? We need to tell everyone, our children and everyone, about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And that's the commandment that God has given us uh, in Deuteronomy and in Exodus. That's what God has done for us. We are to pass on the good news, and we need to be empowered to do that. We need to have the Holy Spirit to have that courage and fortitude to repeat this truth from generation to generation. It makes a difference in the lives of our children, and especially when we can share what God has done for us personally. There is a story I recently heard that I thought you all might like to hear. There was a man in his uh, 20s or 30s, called. he called his mom, and he sounded desperate and said, Mom, I, I needed to talk to you. Um, I just have to talk to you about something. She said, okay, son, what is it? I was planning on committing suicide. I'm at my kitchen table, and I have the gun on the table before me. And every time I pick it up, a song comes to me from my childhood that I heard when I was in the children's ministry in Mops. The song was, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so I couldn't put the gun to my head as I tried. I had planned to do it. And every time I picked up the gun, the young man said the song would run through my head. I put the gun down, picked it up, determined to kill myself, and the song would come again. But I decided to call you instead and tell you I remembered how God loves me. This was a story told by a woman at the Mops conference just recently. So when we tell the history of what God has done for us personally to our children, it will make a difference in their lives because they love you, they respect you. Every daughter and son loves their mother. And I don't know how this happens, but when you share the gospel, lives are changed. And that's what I don't know how that happens, Lord, but the Lord does it to us and he changes our hearts. And when we share the gospel, we are changed because the gospel is powerful. And one thing I noticed too about myself that when I begin to share with somebody my personal story or something to help someone understand the gospel message, what happens to me is I seem to understand it more myself when I'm trying to explain it to somebody. Probably if you're a teacher, you'll get that. I, I had to discover it on my own. So also, I'm prompted to share with you that we are told in Proverbs 4.23 that we need to be careful of how we think because our lives are shaped by our thoughts. So remember the scripture that says, take every thought captive and bring it under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Take everything captive and every thought captive and bring it under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That is 2 Corinthians 10.5. That is how we battle. Because we are called to be careful how we think 
because our thoughts will guide us into action. God is more interested in changing our minds more than changing our circumstances. Now, when I thought about that, I laughed because I thought, this is, I'm always asking and praying that God will change the circumstances I'm in. <laughs> Get me out of here now. Get me out of this problem. That's where I am. So thoughts are powerful. Uh, they shape our lives for good or bad. And that is why we sometimes believe the lie of false judgments. Sometimes people make false judgments about our, us and we can't believe the lie. We have to go back to Jesus and bring that thought captive under the Lordship of Jesus Christ so that we might remember who we are and whose we are. But the Word of God says, In everything give praise and thanks to the Father, for this is His will for you who are in Christ Jesus. So we're in a circumstance. We need to go ahead and continue to praise God and thank Him for what's happening. There's a funny story I have about a friend and neighbor. And I remember the story about her. Um, she was very spirit-filled and is still. And she, her husband was a believer, but not in the deep relationship with Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit um, as she was. So when he called her and said, Honey, I just had a fender bender on the freeway, an accident. And she replied, Praise God! And he thought, Is she crazy? <laughs> so remember, she wasn't sure what that meant at the time, I'm sure, but she was obedient to the Word of God in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, give praise and thanks to the Father, for this is His will for you who are in Christ Jesus. So it's never easy to be immediately obedient, but sometimes it actually happens. I actually had an experience on Tuesday of this week. I was assigned to be the lector on that day, and when I sat down in my pew, the Lord said to me, go and check the reading of the day. So I said, okay, Lord, I'll do it as soon as the daily rosary is completed. And so when the rosary was completed, the Lord said, go now. Go and check the readings. And so I thought that the Lord wanted me to check the prayers of the faithful because I hadn't read those yet. And maybe I thought he wanted me to uh, read ahead of time the intention of the Mass person that day because sometimes the names are hard to pronounce or something I didn't know. But he said, go now. And so I did. I said, yes, Lord. And so when I looked at the readings, they were not the ones in the Magnificat that I had practiced the night before. And not only that, but there were two choices. And I said, whoa, what do I do now? Which one do I read? And so I went and told Zyda, guess what, Zyda? The readings aren't up there that, I'm, that I practiced last night in the ones in the Magnificat. And she got her eyes big and said, oh, dear. Okay, so let's go ask Father. So we went and we asked Father. Um, and um, so he told me what what needed to be read. But not only that, the, the readings blessed me so much because they were very familiar to me, but the joy for me was the Psalm 126 that I read. The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for us. And I think most of you know the Lord gave me the words to that song, and we use it in our masses. Uh, on the retreat and other masses too because it's so fun. The Lord has done great things. And the way the Lord gave me that song at one time was I was in the car and I was just singing to the Lord, just loving the Lord. And I just began to sing that song. It, it wasn't any song that was written that I knew or even the tune. So I just was praising the Lord in the car. And so I got home and I opened up my Bible just to read. And there it was, Psalm 126, the Lord has done great things for us. I saw, wow, I didn't know that, Lord. It was the word you were getting me to sing. I love it. So sometimes we just go go for what we can go for what we can do. And so the gospel was Jesus saying that day, my brothers and my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and act on it. So there was my example of Rhema. I said, Wow, that's Rhema. You spoke to me, Lord, and I did act on it. Yippee! So, I want to invite you today to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in our prayer, if you have already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I invite you to renew your commitment to Jesus. 
but those who have never uh, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit before, in just a few minutes I'm going to ask that you, um, that you stand for that. So, how did John go about baptizing? He called for preparation. How do you get ready for company? Me and I dashed through my house trying to clean off the table and I put it in bags and stick it in the computer room. <laughs> it's not a good idea, but that's how I prepare. I tried to hide everything. And so we can't hide our sins from God, right? We can't hide. But we clean our home if somebody's coming. We take a bath. We wash our hair. Get ready. And so John the Baptist was calling everybody to prepare the way and get ready for the spiritual preparation. And so being a priest... He was of the priestly line, remember that. Uh, he knew and understood the need for purification. Because when a man entered into the temple, the very first thing he did, we learned in Exodus, they would wash in the bronze basin before they could enter in to the temple. And it was a sign of purification for them, as well as they would confess and turn away from their sins. Now, they would lay their hands on that lamb, and the lamb would be slaughtered. They confessed their sins on the lamb or whatever animal it was, and their sins would be um, imparted to that lamb, and then the lamb would be slain. That's why John the Baptist is going to say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, the words of the psalmist come to mind. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness. I don't know if you know that song. Create in me a clean heart. Put a new and bright spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. And that's why we have confession. We can repent. We can go to confession, confess our sins, and walk in purity again with God because um, he wants us to have that clean heart. And so the way we have a clean heart without killing a lamb, Jesus died on the cross for us. And so we ask him to create in us a clean heart. Um, and we can easily do that with the sacrament of reconciliation. Now John's baptism called for repentance, a contrite and humble heart, a recognition of our sin, but a sincerity of sorrow meaning contrite heart for our sins. That's what's necessary for true repentance, and the repentance is away from that sin. And so repentance um, and baptism is important. Now, baptism is one reality is this. It is the outward action of purification which expresses the inner reality of our heart of repentance. I'm going to say that again. Baptism is the outward action of purification, which expresses the inner reality of our heart of repentance. This is why um, we come to confession. But this, the reason we want to do that now and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit is because we were babies when we were baptized. And yes, we received the Holy Spirit, but we did not make an adult commitment, an adult yielding to the Holy Spirit. So that's what we do today. We're going to yield to the Holy Spirit and renew our commitment to Jesus if, if we've already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But more than that, John's baptism was an act of faith that the Messiah was coming. Now this act identified God's people waiting in anticipation for his coming. So that was the baptism of John, repentance. It's something we continually need to do. But baptism is a once in a lifetime event because through baptism, our sins and our stain of original sin is washed from us and all our sins are washed away as the scripture says in Romans, I will read it to you, Romans 6, 1 through 4. <clears throat> Does it follow that we should remain in sin so as to let grace have greater scope? Of course not. We are dead to sin, so how can we continue to live in it 
Haven't you wondered that? So you have been taught that when we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. In other words, when we were baptized, we went into the tomb with him and joined him in death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the Father's glory, we too might live a new life. So we are living in that kingdom right now. This, this is where we live right now. We are kingdom people. We have already been died with Christ and been raised up with him. And so that's the spiritual reality. And so we want to live in that spiritual reality. And we can only do it if we ask the Holy Spirit to baptize us and live in that baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now the work of God is accomplished on the cross by Jesus. And that is his most holy and precious blood shed for us on the cross. At the same time, we have been saved through Jesus, death and resurrection. And we also are being saved as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. As Paul said to the Philippians in 2.12, we must in the flesh work out that which was accomplished by Jesus, and that is our salvation. Now this process is the way we live. It is called sanctification, which is the process of growing in holiness through my actions, yet in fact, at the same time, I cannot make myself holy. It is a God work. Holy means set apart from God, and the God work is the faith that I receive of God's grace. Holy means set apart by God, to be his, and that's who you are. You are a holy people. So I want to renew that today, to yield to the power of the Holy Spirit within. So we want to plug into the power. John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but the one coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John said, I'm not fit even to undo his sandals. So let's look at the difference. When Jesus came, he baptized with the Holy Spirit. That is, John's baptism prepared people for the Messiah and the Messianic age to come. After Jesus came, suffered, died, and rose, and before he ascended, he received from the Father the blessing to distribute the Holy Spirit to everyone who believed. So the risen Lord is commanded by the apostles, and the Lord Jesus commanded, excuse me, the apostles, in Matthew 28, 19, to go into all the world to baptize in a way that was no longer a symbolic preparation of repentance. But this baptism would be a sacramental fulfillment of the promise of the Messianic Age, which was that prophecy given by Joel, the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit upon us. Now the apostles bore witness to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that Pentecost day when they said, this is what God promised through Jesus, to pour out his Holy Spirit. And the people witnessed what was happening. And the people were praying in tongues, and they're saying, tell us what must we do? And Peter said, you must repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. So Jesus' baptism is a baptism of forgiveness of sins. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. So we need baptism of water and the Holy Spirit. So through ordinary baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit. What happens when we or people ask, do you have the Holy Spirit? Yes, I was baptized. I'm a Catholic, cradle Catholic, matter of fact. But I have yielded to the Holy Spirit. I have him, but does he have me? And the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is our knowledge that God sent Jesus, coupled with the belief that Jesus is the Christ, combined with our yes to the will of God. This is how we move into an adult faith, receiving Jesus as Lord, yielding to the Holy Spirit's guidance in our lives. And how will we know in faith we will know because we are going to ask. And he says, all who ask will receive. So the Holy Spirit in us will quicken us to know that God is our Father, our Abba, our Daddy, and that we can have our salvation through him. And that you can't have one without the other, as I said. 
because God is in us. The fruit will be eternal. You will be evidence of God's work and his gifts pouring from your life. You will be enabled by the Holy Spirit to hear the word of God and act on it. And that's that rhema of God who wants this irresistible light of the Holy Spirit today. Jesus is coming again, so I invite you, those who want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I invite you to stand right at your table and receive and say yes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and clothe yourself with the power from on high.